Hi, I'm here with uh, Michael O'Brien, a writer and a speaker, uh, an artist, and uh, we've had Michael on the show before and weren't able to grab him, but he's passing through town. I wanted to be sure to interview him for our blog. So, you know, I remember when you were here last time, we had a delightful conversation just about your writing. And um, I was wondering if you could talk about that first book you wrote and how you felt it was really given to you by the Lord. Uh, my first published novel was Father Elijah, uh, published in 96. But a couple of years before that, um, as a young, as an artist, a Catholic artist, I was going through a period of discouragement, um, trying to raise a large family in an anti-family culture in Canada, anti-life, growing anti-life culture, and really feeling quite overwhelmed at times. And I remember one day being making a, a visit to our parish church, uh, and and just pouring out my heart to the Lord. Um, without trying to make myself look pious, I was actually just quite desperate. I, uh, I, was, I threw myself in, on my knees in front of the crucifix, the cross, the big cross on the side in our church, and was kissing it and um, pleading with the presence of the Lord in the tabernacle, just saying, I, you know, I'm finished. There's, I, I don't see how I can survive. As a Christian artist, uh, I wasn't much of a writer then, but uh, I've written some things. Uh, how do we get our children through these times? How do we give them hope? How do we give them a vision of the coming triumph of the Lord uh, over all of creation? Uh, uh, how do I do that? How do I protect and nourish my children and those others you've given to me, Lord, in a time such as this. And I, I was really, really pleading from the heart. <laughs> and at one point I burst out, don't you see, Lord, don't you see? Look at the condition of your church. Look at the condition of your people. Um, this is a place of desolation. And really, the particular church in Canada at that time was, was in very rough shape. And there's much improvement in the 15 years since that moment, but, um, and things to that effect. Don't you see this is a desolation? And um, without warning, and totally unexpected, um, this incredible supernatural peace felt me, which is so at odds with what my emotions were doing at the time, it just astonished me, and I fell silent. It was very powerful, kind of an, an anointed piece. And I heard an interior voice say, in this place of desolation, I will give uh, fruitfulness. And I, I sensed it as a word from our Lord, spoken in the heart of the soul. But th there also came with it uh, an inner sense that I must go up to the lectern and read the Holy Scriptures. Now, I went up, and the lectionary was closed that day. Now, I, d I don't use the Bible as a Relax. fortune telling, <laughs> but, uh, but on occasion, I have sensed the Lord wishes to speak to me that way. Mm -hmm. So I prayed, and I went up, and I just opened the lectionary, and it was a passage. I, th I think it's in the Book of Wisdom. Um, sorry, I've forgotten it. Um, and it was, in this place of desolation, I will give fruitfulness. Wow. So, oh, what are the what are the odds? <laughs> you know, and I didn't know what I was opening to, so I thought, oh, this is wonderful. Yeah, I, you are here, Lord. You are. <laughs> I, I'm not alone, carrying all these responsibilities, and it was tremendously consoling. And I thought, wow, wow, I can go home now. But it wasn't over, and there came this kind of gentle command that I should kneel. And as I was kneeling, into my mind, there flooded a story. And now, at that time, I, had, I was not thinking of myself as a writer. Uh, all my heart and soul was in being a Christian painter. Uh, this incredible story, uh, fully, fully formed almost, uh, poured into my imagination. And also the sense that 
the Holy Spirit wanted me to write it down. And um, so for the next eight months, this incredibly interiorly visual story, complete with tons of dialogues, seemed to have been just given. Although, of course, it's grace working with nature. It's, it's part me and part whatever was given from above. Uh, it just uh, took about eight months to, to write and uh, the novel, Father Elijah. And um, I went to the Blessed Sacrament every morning. We didn't have a resident priest. Uh, it was a mission parish. Uh, but I, I did have the key to the church, so I could visit the Lord in the Eucharist every day. And every day for eight months of writing, I asked the Lord for the grace of the creation of this work. For what end, I didn't know. I thought, well, there was always a little bit of hope it might be published, but I was pretty sure it wouldn't be published. Well, the funny thing is you're an artist and you need more money, right? You're a starving artist, so to speak. <laughs> And then you're given a book to write. It's not exactly an immediate answer to more funding, is it? No, but, you know, little by little things happened. Paintings, a few paintings sold, got us through a few months. I was also the editor of a Catholic family magazine at the time, Nazareth Journal. And there was a little stipend from that. So bits and pieces we put together enough to survive. We were caretakers, my wife and I and our kids. We lived in a... In a an abandoned rectory of, the, of this church, and our rent was $50 a month. I couldn't have survived without these, these things. We lived there for 10 years while I was painting and writing my first books. But I never, I never sent the novel to anyone because I had become convinced that it was hopeless, that, that the dictatorship of moral relativism had devoured everything and it had squeezed Catholic culture into a ghetto. Now, that, that really was a bad temptation, and it was really, really wrong that I had fallen into that kind of hopelessness. Um, but the Lord, in his sweet, beautiful humor, um, wasn't paying over much attention to my moods. He gave me a gift, a new, another gift. And from that gift, like a seed planted in what appeared to be a cold, desolate time, season, the book was eventually published a year later um, against my wildest pessimism. Uh, you sent it, when you sent it, was Ignatius Press that published it? Yes, uh, but I didn't send it to them. Um, I had self-published a little book of my paintings, and they had stumbled across it somehow. They had um, published, distributed it. They didn't publish it. And it began to move fairly well. Uh, so at one point, their general manager phoned me and says, well, do you have anything else you've put together? We might be interested in looking at it. I said, well, <coughs> I said, uh, well I've written a novel, but you wouldn't be interested in that. I mean, I was totally convinced there was no hope in that. Ignatius wasn't publishing fiction, and v most fiction, most fiction publishing publishers in the Catholic world were were just dying on the vine. They couldn't make a go of it. So um, Ignatius Press said, "Well, send us the manuscript and let us have a look at it." And I said, "In all honesty, I said I don't have the ten dollars to mail it to San Francisco," and you're not going to accept it for publication anyway. So let's not waste $10. And he, sa <laughs> he said, send it to us, we'll send you the $10. <laughs> so, uh, which he never did, by the way. He never did? Was that <laughs> he never did, was no. That no, it was that? Tony Ryan. And uh, he's, he's such a humorous guy, he's a good friend. But anyway, he, um, Within two months, they had sent me a contract, and they said, yeah, we're going to, we believe in this book. We're going to risk it. We don't know how it's going to sell, but uh, it's, I think it's sold in the last 15 years now. It's sold over 80,000 copies. Is that your best-selling book? Yes. But uh, you mentioned the, the hopelessness that peop 
that you fell prey to, what is the antidote to that? How do you, what have you learned from that? Mm, good question. Um, I think it's not, it's not like flicking a switch inside oneself and saying, ah, let's get more hope, let's get more juice, hope juice. Um, I think it's, it's a process of learning to see that God is always at work, always. If we do not lose heart, if we do not run away from the cross, he's always bringing new good out of it. Um, for me, it's, it's to learn to be a child in the heart again, to, to say, my father is looking after me. Now, not in the style I would like to grow accustomed to, but in the way that is best for me and my family. So we've never had security. Uh, we never will have security. Uh, we've given our whole lives to the service of the Lord and his church. And he's not going to let us be without our basic needs. And we've learned this endlessly over and over and over again. So for me, it's been a healing process of wherever I was not trusting on some inner level in my life had to be healed, had to come to know my father loves me. My father loves you. He loves each of us. He will care for us unless we block him out. And I saw that fear, not just sin, but fear blocks out the actions of God. It can. Uh, how, what did I learn from this? That after sin, fear is my greatest enemy and discouragement as well. Um, the enemy loves to use discouragement a lot with people who desire to serve Christ. Um, it's his next best weapon after, after sin. I began to look more closely at the roots of fear in my heart and, and, and discouragement and to see these as a temptation. And every time fear arose in my heart or discouragement, started to slip into a mood of discouragement, I would see that as a gift, as a moment of opportunity to say, ah, okay, here's where I begin to thank and praise God, where there doesn't seem to be any great reason for thanking and praising God. This is, this is what honors him best, like the three young men in the fiery furnace. Eh? It's, that's the least likely place where you'd start singing chants of praise to God. And that's why it's so beautiful. And, and the glory of the Lord can pour through. And also, by thanking him and praising him in all circumstances, our hearts are changed. Gradually, little by little, our hearts are changed. To have more confidence, uh, to throw ourselves rashly, confidently into his, his hands when there's no human reason for trusting. What about the element, um, you mentioned that you know, God will give us the things that we need, and when we think we need more than what we're getting, <laughs> which I know you're a father of how many children? Six. Six, and you've had to do without many things, I would assume. And yes. But you know, as my children have got older and older, and, and some of them have begun to raise their own families, um, as they mature, they've come back to me and said, Dad or Mom, you know, thank you so much you didn't let us have everything we wanted. Thanks, thanks for giving us other kinds of things. Mm -hmm. You know, now there were years where they weren't very happy about our, we're pretty much on the bottom of the uh, economic life in my country, you know, um, just scrabbling to survive day by day. But that taught us to trust, and in a sense it taught them to trust. And they, they also saw their parents loving God, continuing to be faithful in the midst of adversity, um, not losing faith, not, not grabbing at hasty, unhealthy solutions to our situation praying always for what we needed. They would sometimes kneel down with us and we would pray, Lord, Lord, we have to sell a painting. And, and then they would hear the phone ring an hour later and someone would want to come over and buy a painting. Mm. They experienced many things like this. 
which if we hadn't had, if we had had financial security, um, they wouldn't have learned. Um, so what was your question, Father? Well, that, that was it. You know, I, <laughs> I, rem I remember one time to, on the show you were here and you were talking about the book Island of the World, and I think in the research you did in Croatia, you know, and something that I remember you said just hung with me, stuck with me, that you said those people have suffered so much that they've, they have a knowledge and experience that you don't get to unless you suffer. Can you talk about that? Well, I, it is the mystery of um, life in Christ. We, we are conformed to the death of Christ, says St. Paul, in order to be conformed to the resurrection of Christ. Um, if we want to go through life like uh, the boy in the bubble, safe, protected from every virus, every pain, uh, we won't learn much, we won't grow. We, we won't learn to die in order that we can be born. Suffering teaches immense lessons, powerful lessons, which cannot be learned by a life of ease and comfort. Sacrifice um, is another way of the cross. Uh, being wealthy, for instance, doesn't necessarily mean you're, you don't know the cross. Uh, being poor doesn't necessarily mean you're living in Christ. Uh, but weakness in any form, if lived in Christ, um, transforms us. It's a great test. It's a terrible test at times. Um, and I think we p are able to come through that test larger people, more full of love, more capable of love and compassion, more capable of truth, receiving truth, to the degree that we have we have gone through the crucifixion with Jesus. And each person's crucifying moments or periods of life uh, will be different, will be unique for their soul. Uh, but they are unavoidable. All human beings suffer. Uh, to suffer without Christ, I, I can't imagine what that would be like. Can you, uh, I'd like to maybe jump a little bit here, jump around a little bit. I was reading one of your articles at your website and it was talking about this um, <clears throat> division that we have in these categories that can be rather very blunt, kind of dumb categories of like liberal and conservative yeah. and things. And you know, if you look at our culture, like in the American culture and the, the media and everything, it seems like we're just so divided, you know, politically and in, and in so many ways. And even some some voices on the left have said, uh, this is a false division. You know, there's, not, there's much more in common between both sides politically, say, you know, by reason, than falling on these lines. And it just struck me that you know, it seemed like Satan really has a field day with that division. Uh, can you speak about the division we have today? And well, um, left and right in politics, it gets very complex. I think the, for a Catholic, for a Christian, um, the determining factor in our political choices has to be the moral order of the universe. Upon this, any sane, healthy society must be built or it will fall. So, we cannot have situation ethics in our choices of who, who we elect. Uh, left, right, conservative, liberal, politically, uh, can mean all kinds of things, especially as the poles shift and mutate and our, our perceptions get blurred. Um, conservative policies can violate the humanity of our brothers and sisters just as much as liberal policies. For example, uh, abo the pro-abortion stance of the left or the pro-war uh, stance of certain kinds of conservatism. You know, collateral damage is acceptable in their thinking uh, as long as peace and security are preserved. Right there, a fundamental principle has been violated. Aggressive war I'm talking about, not defensive war. The problem of these artificial constructs becomes 
more dangerous when we start applying them to the church, the mystical body of Christ. Um, left, and, left and right, liberal, conservative are political categories and very misleading when we start to apply them uh, to, the, to the church, which is the body among us, the bride. This is the bride of Christ right. here we're mm -hmm. talking about. She who must be prepared to meet the bridegroom. The danger of such categories is we start all becoming politicized. Within the church, we start becoming strategists, manipulators, propagandists. Instead of um, conforming ourselves to Christ carrying the cross, crucified on it, and coming through the resurrection. Do we love the church in the fullness of the teachings of the church? Do we love Peter and listen to him and obey him? Um, do we seek the fullness of Christ's life within our own personal lives? Not keeping a compartment for our religious faith and another compartment for our cultural entertainment consumption and another compartment for our political um, stances, no compartmentalization. A, a Christian is one person, integrated. That's where we're getting messed up by Satan. All this, these splits in consciousness and splits in our thinking. Uh, you had an interesting article too about uh, the globalization that's taking place, and and I'm not familiar enough with the terms to be precise, but. I know, you know, John Paul II praised, you know, cooperation among nations, obviously, and, and praised, you know, the good attempts at the EU and things. But I know many of us in America, you know, we're kind of isolationists, and we see big government and the mm -hmm. errors and the pro-abortion lobby and everything. And in your article, you have a quote from John Paul talking about this efforts at globalization and, and working in harmony, which Benedict praised in his, his encyclical on the so, and social teaching, you know, that the, these governments are in a unique opportunity to help the poor, the countries that have yes. so much less than the West. And, but at, at the same time, that's not promoting this one universal governmental power, that's right? right. Could you right. talk about that distinction? Yes, um, the, church, the church is not always reducing or ever reducing um, crucial questions affecting the future of mankind, the well-being of mankind, to simplistic notions. Either you're a nationalist or a globalist. I mean, that the church doesn't think that way because that isn't helpful at all. But it is, it is as a voice of conscience for mankind, the church, the, the Holy Fathers have said, it is a movement towards the good when men work together in peace and work for a common goal of, of the well-being of man and the dignity of the human person. John Paul II and Benedict, with, with perhaps even greater emphasis, have underlined that um, the dignity of the human person, each and all human persons, are the foundation of any just society, of any kind of evolution in the moral order. Both of them warned against the new globalism, um, the potential dangers in the new globalism for um, negating the value of the human person, uh, negating the unique genius of peoples and nations. Neither of them are advocating a world state, world government. But let us work together, let us cooperate, yes, of course. And form structures, right, that can help to decrease poverty and, yes. and things. Uh, without, without creating a structure uh, that becomes absolutist, statist. They're, I mean, they're, they're thinking in very finely nuanced categories here. Um, liberals have been threatened by it. New World Order guys have been threatened by it. Neoconservatives have been threatened by it. Um, it's, it's been a bit shocking to see how even some... Catholic neoconservative commentators have been strongly critical of Pope Benedict's latest encyclical, Caritas in Veritate. Um, something in it threatened them. 
What was that? Why were they threatened? Why didn't they hear what he was saying? Was there a higher value that they're more loyal to? The New World Order people are a more obvious situation because they are generally anti, anti-Christian. Uh, they are willing to sacrifice people on the altar of their greed. Um, anti-population is coupled with the new globalism and New World Order thinking behind many world leaders. All of that is very, a very obvious disorder and potentially extremely dangerous. But we have to be careful um, that we don't play into that, that we don't assist that degeneration of the human community by positing a different kind of evil, a lesser evil. I know some, we just had a, uh, the Youth Defense Group from Ireland, and it's, uh, it's a small organization that, that fights for life. And um, in Ireland, you know, it, abortion's illegal, but there's still many uh, things, works that they do to, to, um, you know, to, for the cause of life. And one of the issues was, I think, Planned Parenthood, you know, paying for people to go to England to have abortions things. But I was surprised, uh, they told me that, I wasn't surprised, I was in one level, I'm surprised. The EU said it was putting economic pressure on Ireland to change their abortion laws. And I was like, you know, it's just like this relentless drive. It's like, it's, it's like this chess game that you, you want to say, why do they care so much? You know? It is. Why do they, question. And that, that's kind of what, uh, that's what frightens me sometimes when we talk about the EU and things, is that it seems like this, this other issue is not a side issue for them, the abortion issue. And, and then, too, it seems like, too, you know, we've seen in this country sometimes how inefficient, you know, big government can, can be, but there's also obviously a lot of good, you know, that can be yes, done. Very much mm-hmm. so. There's so much good in America, and part of it is, is that it's a nation founded upon sacrifice and hope, hope for a better world, uh, hope for a new kind of democracy. Uh, We're talking about the founding generations and even up until the last couple of generations, few generations. Um, Of course, there is a nation here. There is a people here with a unique kind of experience. Um, In Europe, the emergence of the increasing power of the EU would not be so troubling if it was really uh, an attempt to bring about more cooperation between nation states and better prosperity and good in the social order. As you, as you say, why this relentless attack upon the moral foundations of Western civilization? Why? And an Im- imposed as well. Why this uh, continual uh, threat and reward approach to, to Catholic nations such as Poland, Ireland, um, Slovakia, largely Catholic nations. What's going on here? Why, why this moral revolution? What does it give the emerging world order in Europe? If, if America were to become part of some kind of international new form of government, governance, um, would some undefined consensus have the power to impose its moral revolution upon America, which is still, to a large extent, a Christian nation? Okay. Confused, divided, but still tremendous good here. Um, so how, that, would you resist it? how would you resist it if you've given away your sovereignty? Right. That that's what I I feel like the neocons will always they get in. They that's the issue. They're one of the issues they hear, mm-hmm. and I guess some different economic issues. But let's shift a moment to the family. Um, you're a married man, have six kids. You know very well the threat. <coughs> well, some some of your kids are now married themselves, right? Yes. Some um, but you know very well the threats against the family. Can you give us a State of the Union on the family today? <laughs> what do you see in your travels as a speaker and everything? Well, everywhere I see very, very brave human beings founding their new families, beautiful people of faith, with courage, hope, they believe God is going to 
um, be present in their domestic church, uh, that much will depend upon grace and even miracle, there are people who are willing to dare, to risk. However, uh, everywhere I go as well, families who are completely, totally open to life, conceiving new human life, are a small minority. Even people of doctrinal orthodoxy are opting for a contraceptive mentality because they do not see how they can possibly have the good life. Uh, how can they afford a home unless they have two salaries? How can they have two salaries um, and have children, uh, more than one or two children? So you see these corners, what I call the diabolic economy of late Western man has forced normal, healthy people uh, on whom God has lavished life and the potential for life into making anti-life choices and trying to find a rationale for it. They may regret it, uh, but they say it's unavoidable. This is, this is the consequence, one of the consequences of um, not learning to walk with Christ in suffering, not learning how to carry crosses. Within the cross, there, there, there is great pain, but there is also a hidden joy, especially the deepening union with Jesus, and, and to see your family fruitful and happy. Do they have everything? No. Uh, uh, but they have everything that really counts. They have love. They have joy. Um, they have learned essential things about existence. The state of the family generally, I think your best answer would be to look to the teachings of John Paul II and Benedict on the struggle that the family now faces in the modern world. It is a call to a radical heroism if you want to live the fullness of Catholic life in these times. Where I live, there are many Catholics living this life. The fathers of the families with one or less than one income. Uh, it's a tremendous struggle. It's a burden. But there are also great consolations and joys. Um, we live surrounded in our community by life. And it's created its almost its own micro-culture, you know, and, it, and it's a thriving, fascinating culture. And it, it doesn't have this sour negativity that you see, this kind of dead look that you see in so much of modern, modern young people, beautiful young people, with haunted eyes. Um, we don't see that in our community. There's hope, you know. There's beauty of heart. And we should say your your community too is. Uh, I just started a, a college, basically, right? I yeah, love that yeah. initiative. You guys sound like uh, real Americans up there. <laughs> well, gosh, gosh, we don't do it like Americans do. You just you just storm the beaches and make things happen. <laughs> We're um, yeah, we. Um, most families in Canada who um, have one or less salaries and uh, a lot of children, most of us cannot afford to send our children to college, or at least orthodox colleges, where at least the fullness of the faith is taught. Um, so about 11 years ago, there a number of parents decided, let's do the impossible. The Lord is the master of the impossible. None of us have the money to send our children to Franciscan U or, or Christendom or TAC. Let's start our own. So, I mean, we're, we're pretty crazy, but we, we prayed a lot. And uh, one of the mothers put down a $5 bill on our kitchen table in our house and said, there, we've begun. That was 11 years ago. The first year, it was a little study center, and six young people, not all of them from our community, but from other places, uh, chose to come and just study the Catholic faith. Most of it was in our living room or in a neighbor's barn. And, um, a number of 
highly educated people volunteer to give teach classes free. The next year, we were offered an empty convent in a nearby town. So the college moved there. More professors came on board, some of them just teaching for $25 a month. Sacrificial people. And the more sacrifice there was, the more fruit there came. Each year, Our Lady Seed of Wisdom grows, always on a foundation of sacrifice, prayer, um, and generosity. Uh, so this year we had a, about 100 students. Our professors have little by little come out of God's vast kingdom. Uh, we have several PhDs teaching full time. We have a number of MAs teaching assistants. Uh, we've got a very rich curriculum. And now those colleges where we could never afford to send our children, many, many universities, accept our three-year program as credits towards a bachelor's um, degree at their university. So many of our young people go for their fourth year at a number of universities, like Franciscan U or uh, Christendom and others. Let me just ask you one last question. Uh, I like to often ask people in the show about their prayer life. How does, uh, how does Michael O'Brien pray? Oh my. Well, my, my wife and I know that our, our children are all uh, off at college or married. Um, we, we have a more, uh, we have increased our prayer life. I mean, we, for 20 years or more, we've prayed the Divine Mercy every day at 3 o'clock. We pray the Rosary every day. Now it's two or three Rosaries a day. We try to get to daily Mass. Um, we have adoration hours, my wife particularly, she has several a week. For me personally, um, all of this, uh, but I try to find moments in an extremely busy life, still more and more busy all the time um, with my work, uh, to have moments of interior stillness where I just turn to the Lord, kneel, just say, be very little and poor before him. Just be a little child before him. Uh, you know, I'm a word person. I write gargantuan novels, you know, so you could just talk <laughs> gargantuan messages to God. And I think the grace he has given me in prayers um, for many, many years, but more so now, is, is silence, in interior uh, attention towards him, his presence. Not always felt emotionally, but something very mysterious, just interior quiet and uh, recollection before his presence. Uh, to me, this is what feeds me most after the Mass and the Rosary and Divine Mercy is to just be a poor man, to be happy in that, just to be very little. It's just so freeing to be God's little poor ones, you know. It's the greatest gift we can know. Well, I'm going to ask you one more question because you had a you had a fun. Uh, you, you may have noticed, Father, that all your questions are extremely short. All my answers are extremely <laughs> long. Right. One more long answer. <laughs> sure, I love long answers. Okay. Um, that the issue about you know our complex and busy lives. Even in monasteries, I just heard Maricacus uh, uh, say something like that too. Even that, how how do you how do you be simple? I mean, how how do you make decisions about how much you can do and and the pace of life to say no to this, yes to that? So it's, it's a difficult one. I mean, we would tend to presume that if anyone asks anything of us, it's got to be from God, but that's that's not really the case. Took me a long time to learn that. Fortunately, I, I have a very good spiritual director who who can be quite firm with me, and he says, "No, you know, for for a year, no travel, no public speaking." And it's such a relief to have obedience, you know, because yeah, I don't have to feel guilty about saying no to some tremendous good that I've been asked to do, <laughs> you know. I don't have to deal with pride over it, you know, I can just relax. Uh, the great spiritual directors teach us that 
if Satan cannot get us in his strategies with mankind into grave sin, if a person is involved in any kind of apostolic work, as of course professed religious are usually, um, he will then move to a different strategy, and that is to so overwhelm you with good to do, so many good things needing doing. The harvest is great, the laborers are few. You have to do it. Um, that you scatter your energies and the primary good that he asked of you, or a few primary goods even, that he asked of you are left weakened and not as fruitful. You may have the satisfaction of saying, ah, I did all these many, many good things, but did you do the primary thing you were called to do well, to the fullness of your, your capacity and gifts in response to grace? So th we have to be aware of that kind of backdoor temptation, uh, which we might call the temptation to the good, but a good that you are not called to. So uh, here's where a spiritual director is very important. And also the humility to say, I, I cannot do everything. You know, if you don't have a spiritual director, um, to say, what are my gifts? Um, where has God shown me in the past that this, this, lie, this way lies peace and fruitfulness? Okay? If there's not a supernatural peace, uh, if there's a deep uneasiness, you shouldn't be doing it. So tricky, tricky discernment territory, but it's necessary for us to learn these things. Uh, otherwise, we would burn out pretty fast. All right, well, thank you so much for thank chatting with us.